have expectation when it comes to grace. Now, we've talked about what expectation is, but just to remind you once again, expectation is getting excited about something you've believed in, which means this, there's a relationship. There's a relationship when it comes to grace and obedience, and that relationship is connected by faith. So when I have expectation on who God is, expectation on what he wants for my life, expectation on his character, when I rest my hope fully upon the grace that he gives, it leads me to obedience. And so grace becomes something that captures our hearts and causes us to want to do what God says for us to do. And so grace changes how we think, but also grace changes what we want. Notice again, as obedient children, not conforming ourselves to the former lust, meaning not being molded or shaped into the way that the world wants to shape us, as in our ignorance or as in the days before we were saved. Now, I remember it wasn't that long ago that Lily um, was saying to one of our daughters who was getting married and moving out, she said, you're lucky. You don't live in this house anymore. You can be bad and you won't get in trouble. Okay. Now think about that for a second. I'm gonna go deep and analyze this. You're lucky because you don't live in this house anymore. You can be bad and you don't get in trouble. Now there's truth there because there's no getting in trouble with us. We're not the ones that are bringing consequences. We're not in that process of disciplining our adult children. That'd be kind of weird, right? But God is. It never stops, okay? But here's the thing to remember. Maturity doesn't see obedience as something we have to do. Listen again. Maturity doesn't see obedience as something we have to do. That's something that we learn as we're growing. So we're thinking as we're a child that we have to do this because if we don't do this, we're going to get in trouble, and that's the way we think. But listen, if we're thinking, well, we have to do this because we're going to get in trouble, then that's not going to change our heart. That's going to change what we do in front of mom and dad. But it's not going to change what we desire. And we're not going to learn why. Why the command? Why was the thing given to do? There's a purpose for all those things. And as children are growing, they're learning what that means. So hopefully they're learning, yes, obedience, and that means just to do what mom and dad said because they said so, right? But there has to be a transformation at some point in time. If they're going to be good adults, they've got to get it. That the command is given because there's a blessing attached to it. The command is given because it's trying to lead us away from something that's bad something that doesn't bless us. So again, maturity doesn't see obedience as something we have to do. Your heart's changed, or to put it more clearly, your appetite has changed. If we feed the flesh, our flesh will long for what the flesh wants. And we won't have an appetite for non-fleshly things. But if we feed the spirit, then something amazing will happen. Not only will we be able to discern what is not of the Spirit, we won't want it. We'll cringe at it. It'll be something that bothers us. You won't have a taste for that thing you used to have. Appetite can change. Appetite is the key. The flesh wants what the flesh wants. That can change, but there's a cost. Turn your Bibles over to Matthew 16. You know the passage well, but I think you need to see it. Matthew 16, verse 24. I think oftentimes we need good reminders from God's word, things that maybe we have read in the past, we've studied, we maybe, maybe even have owned, but we could put on the back burner. We can put on the back of the shelf as if that's something we know so we don't have to be challenged with it. Not so. Oftentimes we need to be challenged with things that we already know because just because we know them doesn't mean we're doing them. In fact, we can deceive ourselves in knowing things if we're not obeying. And so notice what it says here in Matthew 16, verse 24. Again, appetite can change, but there is a cost. 
Matthew 16, verse 24, it says this, Then Jesus said to his disciples, so those who belonged to him, those who were following after him, Jesus says to them, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Notice again, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Now, what does it mean? If we're going to deny ourselves, we have to live in that place of denial, self-denial, that we say no to ourself. So there's a decision that we make to say no to the flesh, meaning the flesh wants what the flesh wants. At some point in time, there has to be at least a choice that says no, even though I want to do it, even though I'm tempted to do it, even though I'm willing to do it right now and give up whatever it means I have to to get what I want, there has to be a point in time, at some point in time, that we start by saying, no, I'm not going to do it. No. And it's not going to be easy. That first time we say no to the flesh, it's hard. And whatever we're trying to say no to. And so there has to be a day where there is, in fact, self-denial. No. Right? If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross. What's that mean? It starts with that first denial, but then there is a process that goes on and a habit that builds where we take up our cross, meaning we put to death the flesh every single day. And we do it as much as necessary, meaning we put to death the flesh in the morning when we wake up. And then you might have to do it again five minutes later. You might have to do it again 10 minutes later when you're in your car driving down the street. You might have to do it again and again and again throughout the day. The idea is it's something you do again and again and again. It's ongoing. It's active. If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself. Then take up his cross, meaning there has to be a death, and follow me. Denial, death, dedication, all three are necessary. When this happens, we find ourselves in that place where our appetites can change because we are feeding, actively speaking, feeding our spirit. We're feeding our spirit, and if we do that, then our spirit will be our flesh. Meaning when we say feed our spirit, we have to be reminded that we are a trichotomy. Remember, body, soul, and spirit, when Adam sinned, when Eve sinned, Mankind fell. The spirit died. And from that point forward, every single person is born body and soul. That's it. Soul, their personality, who they are, their body, what you can see. When we come to Christ, we are quickened according to Ephesians chapter 2. We are made alive by the grace of God. And having been made alive by the grace of God, now our spirit is made alive again. And we are no longer body, soul. We are body, soul, and spirit. But the spirit's on top. So when we are saved, we are as spiritual as we're ever going to be. Our spirit is on top in control. Then the soul, then the body. But right after we get saved, we're going to sin. And when we sin, all of a sudden what happens is we are unsaved again? No. But the order of body, soul, and spirit changes. So no longer are we spirit, soul, and body. We are in the flesh when we sin. And we are body, soul, and spirit. The body's on top. Those flesh of desires. So which one is on top? The body or the spirit, you choose. The one you feed is the one that's on top. You feed the one that wins. Walk in the spirit, and you shall not satisfy the lusts or evil cravings, is what it means, of the flesh. So in other words, walk in the spirit, and you shall not satisfy the appetites of the flesh. Or feed the Spirit. And you will not give in to the appetites of the flesh. That's what we need to do. Appetite is key. And so there's that cost. 
denial, death, dedication. And when that happens, we will build a passion. And that passion becomes the next key for us when it comes to this idea of the spirit reigning over the flesh. You see, whenever we do something, it becomes a passion to us. So if we sin in one area, <clears throat> that area we sinned, that failing becomes a, becomes a temptation of tomorrow. So when we blow it in this way yesterday, one day, two days, three days, five days, three years from now, that thing will come up again. We've tasted it. We've done it. And now it can become a temptation for the future. I've never used drugs in my life, ever. It's never been a temptation to me. And I'm thankful for that because I know many people who struggled with that for many, many years of their life. It's never been a failure here. It's not a temptation here. Now, if I gave up and I gave myself to it here, it'll be a temptation again and again and again. But it wasn't for me. And so I'm free from that. But the areas in my life where I have failed, those areas can come back again. Those things can become a temptation once again. And it can be very hard to get past that. It can be a thing we end up struggling with for many years. Augustine, the early church father, was a man who could relate to that. He was a man who had been raised in a home with many godly people. He rebelled against that, went to do his own thing, and eventually gave himself over to a life of total debauchery. Alcohol, women, partying. And eventually, through the prayers of his mom for many, many years, God got a hold of his heart. But when God got a hold of his heart, there was one particular woman that still had a peace. And it was very hard for him to get past the temptations that she presented. Until there was a day that he got what Jesus said in Matthew 16, 24. Denial, death, and dedication. And so he found himself in the same town as this woman was at. She recognized him, and she called out to him, and she said, Augustine, Augustine, and he ignored her. It was like she, he's thinking she's like the smoke monster from Lost. Right? If she speaks and I look at her, it's too late. Right? It's going to attach me. And so, no, he didn't even look at her. She called out again, Augustine, Augustine, and she hurried after him. He didn't respond. Augustine, it is I. She said her name. And without turning around, without looking at her, he said, that is true. But it is not I. There has to be a day that we die. We utterly die. We get to a place where we say, this is no longer who I am. I deny myself, deny myself, which means I'm getting smaller and smaller and smaller, and eventually I'm dead. And then I crucify the flesh on a daily basis. How does that happen? Well, Galatians 2.20 says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Not I, but Christ that lives in me, and the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave his life for me. Listen again. I am crucified with Christ. I'm dead. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Not I, but Christ who lives in me and the life I now live in the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave his life for me, meaning this, it takes a passion to conquer a passion. And when we have a passion for God, we feed the spirit and it's spirit, soul, and body. It doesn't matter what the passion of the body is. It'll never be as strong as that passion for Christ. It takes a passion to conquer passion, but we have to choose. And so when that happens, have to's. Have to's become want to's. And eventually what happens when we keep on feeding our spirit and we have that passion for Christ, all of a sudden our desire for sin lessens. Our willingness to obey increases. 
and have tos become want tos and eventually want tos actually become get tos where I get to do what is pleasing to God. And then you become what the Bible describes as a hilarious giver. The things that you give to God, you rejoice in being able to give. Not just your money. You rejoice to be able to give your time, your talents, and your treasure. And as God leads, you respond. That's what happens. Again, maturity doesn't see obedience as something we have to do. There's a change. So grace changes what we want so that we want to do what is good. Again, grace changes what we want so that we want to do what is good. Notice what it says, as obedient children, not conforming. So we are to be resting our hope fully upon God's grace as obedient children, not conforming. That word conform means to squeeze into a mold. That's exactly what the world tries to do with us. It wants us to think the way it thinks and it wants us to want what it wants. And so it's trying to squeeze us into a mold. We're not to be like that. Notice, overwhelmed by grace as obedient children, not conforming. So we're not conformed into a world that's gotten sicker and sicker and sicker. The Bible speaks in Isaiah 5 uh, verse 20 about a time that there would be where people would call evil good and good evil. We live in that time where things that are evil are called good. Things that are good are literally called evil. And it's this weird, perverted time. And the world is trying to shape our thinking so that we think the way it thinks and wants what it wants so that we'll be what it is. And we need to fight against it. We need to push against that. I'm shocked by how many times I read in social media or I read in the news how the world refers to our views biblically as controversial. So that if you speak about a thing, whatever that thing might be on an issue of morality, it's referred to as controversial. So so so-and-so holds a controversial view. Now, you could be a total reprobate and talk about all these different things that are horrible that people would do, and that's just normal. That's not controversial. But when you speak of morality, when you speak of justice, when you speak of what's right, what's pure, what's holy, it's controversial because that's the nature of the world. The world is wanting to conform us into that so we become like it. That's the only reason why Amazon would come out with a story on Cinderella and have a fairy godmother that looks to be a cross-dresser. It's the only reason why that would happen. I'm not interested in being the judge over anyone's entertainment, and I'm certainly not interested in being the police over anyone's entertainment. But let me just challenge you with this. If you watch that, if you share that with your kids, it won't stop there. There'll be the next thing, the next thing, and the next thing, and the next thing, and the next thing. Because they do an incredible job of shaping the way people think. The primary way Americans are shaped in terms of their viewpoint, I used to say, was education, meaning the education system, entertainment, popular culture as a whole. I don't believe that anymore. I think we're shallow enough as a culture that the primary way that we are shaped in terms of our worldview is entertainment. Because so much money and so much time is spent on entertainment. And it changes the way people think, it changes what they want, and all of a sudden they become something very different than they were before. Because entertainment has shaped our minds to not think that sin is sin, and to not know what is good and what is bad. And frankly, for the most part, to not even care. And so, We need to fight against the world's effort to squeeze us into that mold because it is actively trying to squeeze us into that mold. There's no controversy about what is good or what is bad. The word of God tells us what is good and what is bad, which means this. I don't have to ask you. You don't have to ask me. We don't have to ask our godly grandmother. We don't have to ask anybody on the face of the earth. You go to God's word and his word will tell you. Amen. His word will tell you what is good and what is bad. We gain wisdom from God's word. Turn over to Romans 12. Romans 12, please. Notice what it says here in Romans 12, verse 2. 
God tells us what is good and what is bad. Why? Why does he tell us? Here's why. Because God loves us and he wants us to do what is right because it's good for us and it's good for others. God's word tells us what is good and what is bad because Satan hates us and wants us to do what is bad because he knows that it will be bad for us and it will be bad for others. And so God tells us what is good and what is bad in his word. Romans 12 verse 2 says this, and do not be conformed, same word, the only other time it's used anywhere in the Bible, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So again, do not be squeezed into that mold. Don't let him do it to you. It'll happen. It'll happen in a subtle way. It'll happen in a process by the way you think and then by how you feel. And before you know it, you will be doing different things and you will become something very different. Don't let it happen. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Think about this for a second. Even by its intrinsic nature, the word implies something negative. Do not be squeezed. Does that sound good? Do not be squeezed into a mold. Have you ever been squeezed? It's never good. Even when it's like your, your really weird great aunt who likes to give you really strong hugs. That's not a good thing. And you just, you can't breathe and she squeezes you really tight. I remember as a kid, you know, you meet so-and-so and they, oh, look at you, Joey, boom. I'm like, I don't like that. I like to breathe. Being squeezed into something is not a good thing. Being squeezed into something that's changing you sounds painful, doesn't it? Notice, do not be conformed, squeezed into this world, but be transformed, metamorphosized. That's supernatural. That's incredible. It's the same idea that describes a butterfly being set free. Do not be conformed but be transformed. Meaning this, conforming hurts your whole life. Conforming causes pain for you and other people. Conforming is limiting. Transforming sets you free. Transforming turns you into something that's amazing with greater capacity than you had before. That's what happens. Do not be conformed, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good. The word means intrinsically good. It's good because it's good. That you may prove what is that good and acceptable, which means well-pleasing, and perfect, which means fulfilling, will of God. Any of this. Who doesn't want happiness? I can't imagine there's somebody who would say, me, I don't want happiness. I don't want to be happy. I mean, who doesn't want happiness? Everybody wants happiness. Well, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and thing that brings happiness, is what the next word means, and fulfilling will of God. Meaning if you want to be happy and have a life that's fulfilled, then be transformed by the word of God. And when God transforms a life, he brings happiness and he brings fulfillment, even regardless of all the circumstances all around. Amen? I don't know about you, but before I was saved, I did what I wanted, but I wasn't happy. I wasn't fulfilled. And when I came to Christ, all of a sudden there was a completely different thing. I was happy and fulfilled. Years later, um, went into the ministry, got married, had kids, moved to Utah, started the church up here, went back home to visit my family in California, went to my hometown, Placentia, and one of my, my in-laws needed something from the store, ended up at the grocery store by myself picking up some stuff. I heard someone behind me, probably 15, 20 feet behind, say, McCormick! Now, you hear that, you know, that's somebody from high school, probably somebody I was in sports with. McCormick. I turned around, I thought, I don't recognize anybody back there. Right? And as he looked at me, he got a little bit closer, 
And he said, hey, it's me, so-and-so. I thought, wow, time has not been kind to him. That's what sin does. I thought, wow. I mean, it was really sad. And he goes, hey, a bunch of us are getting together. We're going to Angelina House. It's this house that in high school was the party house. And if you wanted to go to a party on Friday night, you went to Angelina House. It's on Angelina Street. And there's just tons of people, hundreds of people gathering there doing all sorts of stuff. I thought, still? I mean, like, we're in our 40s. Still. It's like very, very teenage. Not teenage here, but I mean teenage there back then. And so we're all getting together over at Angelina House. You know, why don't you come? Yeah, I appreciate the invite, but I'll pass. Okay. At which point he says this. He says, Oh, yeah, that's right. I heard that you became a priest or, you know, something like that. Hey, well, not a priest. I'm married. I have kids. And he goes, huh, oh, yeah. I got a few of those. Wives, that is. Here's a guy who's gone through multiple marriages, a guy who has been in and out of jail, a guy who's been worn by sin, not getting, it doesn't work. It doesn't make you happy. It doesn't make you fulfilled. In his mind, he would refer to me as being chained, which really isn't uh, far off from truth because I have a wife. And in Spanish, that means she's my esposa. And esposa means handcuff. So... You're my handcuff. <laughs> and I'm hers. Esposa, esposo. Beautiful picture. What it's saying isn't that she's the ball and chain. What it's saying is I'm fettered by love. And if you are fettered or arrested by love, It changes everything. Your desires change. Your will changes. You change. And that's why it says, do not be conformed to this world. That's that guy. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's the Bible. That you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect, or what is that well-pleasing and fulfilling will of God. I love that. God's plan for your life is intrinsically good. Satan's plan for your life is intrinsically bad. You choose. And so we have a choice to make. This is why, by the way, Benjamin Franklin said, sin is not bad because it's forbidden. Sin is forbidden because it's bad. Listen again so you don't miss this. Sin is not bad because it's forbidden. It's not just this forbidden thing. So don't do it. There's no power in that. Sin is forbidden because it's bad. And this is important to understand because too often we give that first part and we tell people that sin is forbidden. So don't do it. And that doesn't help us. Because I remember what happened when I was a kid and I was told that and I was told not to do something at a particular wedding. The reception was at our house. My dad walked outside. There were a group of us younger people there, seven, eight, nine years old. And my cousins and I were all gathered together. And he said, hey, don't drink the beer. And he put this big cooler outside. And he said, don't drink the beer. Now, probably he was saying, don't drink the beer because I want it. But he said, don't drink the beer. Okay. And when he said, don't drink the beer, he walked away. And all my cousins and I, we looked at each other and we thought, want a beer? You told us not to do it. It's forbidden. We want to do what's forbidden. A half hour later, we're on the side of the house drinking beer. That was my first beer. Because he said, don't drink the beer. I never would have thought to drink the beer. But here, since he said, don't drink it, and we drank it, we thought, this is what they get excited about? This is horrible. As we drank it, all of us are spitting it out. (laughs) But because he said, don't do it, we knew it's forbidden, so it must be good. So we kept on doing it. 
And that's what happens. You get older, you're more sophisticated. You keep on doing something you know wasn't good the first time. And you keep on doing it and it becomes something you can't live without. Again, notice what it says. Great quote. Sin's not bad because it's forbidden. Sin is forbidden because it's bad. God knows what it will do to you. And that's why he says, don't do it. Grace changes what we want so that we want to do what is good. Lastly, grace changes what we want so that we want to have what is good. Notice what it says. As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lusts as in your ignorance. Meaning this, your former evil cravings. Again, grace changes what we want so that we want to do what is good And then grace changes what we want so that we want to have what is good. Not our evil cravings, not our lusts. We want to have what God wants to give us. And so notice again, not conforming yourselves to the former lust as in your ignorance. Meaning this, before we knew better. Before we knew better, we had an appetite for evil. But now we know better. What's that mean? 2 Corinthians 9. Turn there with me. 2 Corinthians 9. Now we know better. Not everything that seems good is good. Not everything that feels good is good. Not everything that tastes good is good. Now we know better. So we know that God is good and that what God gives us is good. We know that. And we know that for a lot of different reasons. While you're turning there, in Psalm 84, I'm just going to read it to you. It says this, For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. It goes on to say, O Lord of hosts, blessed is the man who trusts in you. So in other words, no good thing will God withhold from those who walk uprightly. Blessed is the man, blessed is the woman who trusts in him. That's a powerful truth. What it means is that grace changes what we want, but faith is the issue. There's an issue of faith. The person who disobeys God and desires sin does not believe that God is good. The person who disobeys God and desires sin does not believe that God gives what is good. And he does. And this is why 2 Corinthians 9 verse 6 says this, But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. He who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, For God loves a cheerful or hilarious giver. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you that you, always having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. Meaning this, you will have an abundance of grace for everything that you have to do. Okay. Now, this passage in its context is talking about financial giving. It's talking about obedience. And that obedience can be applied to anything, which means this. But I say to you, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. You obey sparingly. You'll reap sparingly. God's good. He'll still bless you because he's good. But he would have blessed you more if you would obey fully. If you obey sparingly, then you'll reap sparingly. He who obeys bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one obey as he purposes in his heart not grudgingly or necessity, fear, for God loves a hilarious obeyer. Okay? Here's what it means practically. God is gracious, and so he gives good things to us. Amen? Is that true? He gives good things to you. The sun rises just because he's good. Okay? So he gives good things. Give obedience in response, and God will be more good to you. In response to that, give up sin, and God will give more good to you. And here's why. No matter what you do as far as giving, no matter what you give up that isn't good, whatever sin, God will always give you more because his nature is to give because he's good, and he'll be a debtor to no man. So you can't outgive God And listen, you can't outdo God. You can't be better than God. It'll never happen. So as good as you can possibly be by your behavior, 
God is better. He'll always grace you more. And now the motivation is no longer having to. The motivation is, I want to. And as that continues to happen in our lives, that we're giving up and God gives, we're giving up and God gives, and we're doing right and God gives, and we're doing right and God gives, as that continues to happen, then here's what takes place. Have to's become want to's, and want to's literally become get to's. I get to honor the Lord. I get to please him. I get to serve him. I get to obey him. I get to trust in him because he never fails me. Amen? Let me finish up with this. Years ago, when I gave my life to the Lord, I was in college. I was 19 years old, and I was working for my dad. And my brother and him, we were working for his company, his contracting company. We were working on a house, and we found ourselves at a house in Orange, California. It was a house that was owned by a very old man. He probably was in his his mid-90s, early to mid-90s. And he'd been a widower for over 20 years. And he wanted to, to fix up the back end and leave it as an inheritance for his kids. And so we were working at his house for months at a time. And somehow he caught wind that my brother and I were just recently becoming Christians. And so he came up to me and he talked to me in the backyard by myself. And he said, hey, do you have a minute? I go, sure. And he says, uh, how you doing? And I said, I'm doing good. And asked me about my faith. And I shared where I was at and how I was wanting to grow. And so... Um, when you have a chance to talk to a person who's been walking with the Lord for over 80 years, it's probably wise to listen. And he started to talk and he would, he would tell stories and he would say something and then he'd pause and he'd say, well, there's an answer to that. And so I'd say, do you want to tell me? And he'd say, well, glad you asked. And he'd go on and say a few more things and he'd say, well, there's a story for that. And I said, do you want to tell me the story? He goes, I'm glad you asked. And then he would tell the story. So that's the way the conversation was going. And he was sharing a lesson about obedience. And he said, well, there's a story for that. And I said, do you want to share that story with me? He goes, I'd love to. He said, when I was a little bit younger than you, about 17 years old, I grew up on a farm in the Midwest. He goes, my parents were both believers. They loved the Lord. And I was their only child. At one point in time, my dad took me aside. And he said, hey, when you take the truck out, Make sure that you come back before nine and make sure that you and your buddies don't drink. And he said, as soon as I heard that, I thought, okay, it's my dad talking. My dad always gave wisdom, you know, try to obey it. But it wasn't that long after that I found myself hanging out with friends after the football game and somebody brought some alcohol. They piled in the back of the truck. We went out to an empty field and we found ourselves drinking. And after we were finished drinking, We got back into the truck. I got in the driver's seat and the rest of them piled in the back and I went down the road and I was impaired. And as I was driving down the road, I lost control and I ran into a tree. When I ran into the tree, the guys of course fell out of the back and they flew forward and they landed in an empty field because my head hit the steering wheel and I was knocked out. When I came to, they were coming to as well and they all got up and nobody was hurt and they just ran off scared. I was left by myself, tasting blood. I thought I'd just split my lip. So I drove home. I parked the truck. I looked at the front, destroyed the whole front end. I went upstairs, and I looked at the mirror, and I'd knocked out my front teeth, two in the top, two in the bottom. Woke up in the morning, and I heard my dad call me. He called my name, and he said, come down, it's time for breakfast which if you grow up on a farm, you know you've already made a mistake because that meant you didn't wake up early enough to do your chores. The chores come first and then the breakfast. He goes, I walked downstairs and my mom and my dad are sitting at the table. And he just pointed to the chair and he said, sit, son. So I sat. And this godly man, he says, his father, looked at him and he said, you've missed your chores. You messed up the front of the truck. I see you've knocked out four of your teeth. What have you learned? And then this old man who was kind of transported into being a teenager as he's talking to me, begins to weep. And he looks at me and he said, I learned. Then when my dad says not to do something, he's saying not to do it because he knows that thing is bad for me 
Would you stand with me?